Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome you Bereans here this morning. Uh, we're continuing in our study of John. We ended this study last time with Yeshua dead and buried. And that was several weeks ago, so we've, you know, it's time to move on and to get to the resurrection, right? We looked at uh, his excruciating death on the cross, a death that was substitutional. He died for his elect. We also looked at his burial. The significance of the burial is that it served as a certificate of death. His burial signified a public notice that Yeshua of Nazareth was dead. And this is where we ended our study. Yeshua is now dead. He's in the tomb. You know, if you can just kind of try to put yourself in the sandals of His disciples at this point, I mean, think of their despair. They've been following Yeshua, gave up their lives, followed Him for three and a half years, listened to Him teach, and now He's dead. And He's in the tomb. Uh, Luke tells us this. This is, you know, a couple of disciples are walking along the road to Emmaus and they don't know it's Yeshua they're talking to. And they said, but we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. That was their hope, and they feel their hope is shattered now. The one they believed to be the Messiah was arrested, he was tried, he was condemned, he was crucified, and he didn't do anything to stop it. I mean, where were his power and glory? Where was the claim of equality with God? So often he had told them that him and the Father were one, and yet he lets this happen? What of his repeated statements about being the source of life? Death has taken him. Was he, after all, just a man? I mean, these questions had to run through their head. And, you know, and the really sad thing here is that their despair, their hopelessness, was a product of their unbelief. Over and over, Christ had taught them that he was going to rise from the dead. He told them in three days, We're going to Jerusalem, they're going to put me to death. You know, after three days, I'm going to rise from the... They, he had taught this over and over. And these men and women who followed Christ, they were familiar with the Scriptures, with the Tanakh. And the Scriptures they knew clearly taught that Christ was to rise from the dead. Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection were all predicted in the feasts of Yahweh. These were annual feasts that they were to go through each year. And these, these feasts were like a presentation, basically, of the truth of God to show what God was doing. They were familiar to all the Jews. They represented and they typified the sequence, the timing, and the significance of the major events of Messiah's redemptive career. And yet, they missed it. Think of them going through these feasts every year and then they get to the year when Christ shows up and they're like, they don't, there's no connection there. You know, the Feast of Passover, it was the first feast. The first Passover was celebrated on the 14th of Nisan. And almost 2,000 years later, Yeshua was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. While Israel was celebrating the Passover, Yeshua, the true Lamb of God, was being crucified. This feast, Passover pictured the Lord's death. Did his disciples not see this? Didn't they get it? Remember how John introduced Yeshua? The next day he saw Yeshua coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. God's Lamb died on Passover at the very time the Passover lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. And they didn't get it. I mean, they should have put this together. What, he's, John said he's the Lamb of God. He's come to take away our sins. He's dying on the cross on Passover as they're sacrificing the lambs. Hey, hey, maybe there's some connection here. Well, the second feast was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It took place on the 15th of the Hebrew month Nisan. This feast was to last for seven days. The first day was a Sabbath, and the last day was Sabbath. These were high Sabbaths. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictures deliverance. Now, I used to say that the Feast of Unleavened Bread pictured His burial. That was wrong. Okay? Because He was buried, not on the 15th, 
He was buried on the 14th. They were in a hurry to get him in the tomb before the sun went down. So don't believe everything I tell you, okay? Do some study for yourself. Check things out. I was really surprised I never got called on to that either. No one ever questioned me about that, you know? It's kind of disappointing. <laughs> All right, Yeshua was buried the same day he was killed. Passover. He's put in the earth before the sun set on the 14th of Nisan. Unleavened bread starts on the 15th, and it's a picture of deliverance because the children of Israel left Egypt on the first day of unleavened bread, and they crossed the Red Sea by the end of the seven-day feast. So that seven days pictures a perfect deliverance. They are now out of Egypt. They are free. It's redemption. Then the third feast was called First Fruits, and it pictured resurrection, the resurrection of Messiah. You can clearly see the gospel in the feast. I mean, these, you go back to Leviticus 23, and all the feasts are given there in order. And if you go back and you look through them, you clearly see the gospel. God had told them this is all going to happen. Well, let's look at this third feast, first fruits, and see what it, what it should have taught the disciples. In Leviticus 23, 10 through 11, let's speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, and you reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh, so that you may be accepted on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Okay, now let me ask you this. What date is this feast to take place on? Passover is the 14th. The text tells that in the first month. On the 14th day is Passover. All right, then unleavened bread is on the 15th day. It starts the next day. Unleavened bread lasts for seven days. So, what date is first fruits? There's no date given. The inspired text says the feast is on the day after the Sabbath. Now, as to what exactly that meant, that's the subject of a lot of discussion and a lot of argument, and even between the Pharisees and the Sadducees argued about what does this mean exactly. Most scholars say the Feast of first fruits took place on the 16th of Nisan. Well, he says the Passover's on the 14th, unleavened bread on the 15th. Uh, why didn't he just say that? On the 16th? That would make sense, wouldn't it? See, they take the Sabbath here to be the Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread. Because that was a Sabbath. But I believe the Sabbath referred to here is the weekly Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. I'm reluctant to say it, but on this issue, I agree with the Sadducees. Yeah, they're like a broke clock. They're right twice a day, right? The Sadducean view was that the Sabbath always referred to a Saturday, and therefore the day after was always a Sunday. And this Sabbath was defined as the first natural Sabbath that fell during the seventh-day festival of Passover and unleavened bread. Now, the Pharisaic view, on the other hand, took the Sabbath to refer to the first day of the festival of unleavened bread that was proclaimed by the words, a holy convocation. That is, that would have been the 16th, which the day after, according to the Pharisees, always referred to the second day of the festival, always the same calendar date. It just seems like it, if that was true, then just put the 16th in there. See, there's no date given in Scripture because this festival is always on a Sunday. That's the important thing about first fruits. It's always on a Sunday. What day did Christ resurrect from the dead? Sunday. First fruits, always on a Sunday. That's why the date's not given. The date changes from year to year, but it's always on a Sunday. What's interesting is that on the year that Christ was crucified, there had to be three days between the 14th and the first day of the week, and it just so happens there was. Isn't that amazing? If the day after the Sabbath was the 16th, it should have just been in the text. That would have made things really simple. He didn't give us a date because it changes year to year. The significant thing here, it's Sunday. It's always the first day of the week. It's significant, therefore, that Yeshua was raised from the dead on the biblical day on which the waving of first fruits of barley harvest took place on a Sunday. I believe that Yeshua was crucified on a Wednesday, 
was buried by the end of the day. He was in the grave from Thursday at sundown until Saturday at sundown, which is three days and three nights, 72 hours. He rose from the dead Sunday morning, sometime after sundown on Saturday evening. So first fruits is always on a Sunday. As to the significance of the feast of first fruits, as with the other feasts, I don't think there's a lot of room for speculation or doubt. It represents the resurrection. And in my thinking, of course, I realize they were blinded, but looking back on them, when they this saw their Messiah put to death, they say, hey, it's the 14th, this is Passover. Well, first fruits is coming, and on first fruits, Guess what? That's resurrection. So they're, they should have all been excited, you know, meeting together saying, guys, we're just going to wait for Sunday and guess what's going to happen? But they didn't catch it. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 23. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So Paul tells us Christ is the first fruits. For as by man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. So hundreds of years before Christ was ever born, God was teaching His people that the Messiah would come. He would die on Passover, the 14th. He, Yeshua was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was teaching His people that for three days Yeshua would be in the tomb and He'd rise from the dead on the first day of week. The, week, the day that Israel is celebrating the Feast of first fruits. Yeshua's and the disciples knew this. They're familiar with the feast. But they didn't get it. They didn't get it. They just didn't put it together. They had no faith to believe these things were going to happen. Now Lazarus, in writing this book, has been taking great pains to show us that Yeshua is in charge of His own dying. And we saw that. He was in charge of His dying. He was in charge of His own burial. And now He's going to show us He's in charge of His own resurrection also. You know, one particular morning, the first fruits are being waved before the altar by the priests in the temple. And on that particular morning, some women are heading to the tomb of Yeshua to anoint Him with some more burial spices. So let's look at John 20, verse 1. says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, before we look at this, I want to back up a little bit, because Matthew gives us a little stuff that happens before this happens. So... Let's jump back to Matthew and get the, you know, what's going on before verse 1 of here. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together. So Christ has been buried, and then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that this imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. It's funny how they got it. But his own disciples didn't get it. All right, they're like, hey, wait a minute. He said he'd rise. Yeah. Why didn't the disciples think about that? Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Lest the disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, are the chief priests and Pharisees concerned that Yeshua is going to rise from the dead? That, that's not their concern. Their concern is that the disciples go and steal Him. See, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They're worried about the disciples stealing Him and say He rose from the dead. Okay, it's a plot here, and they, they don't want this to, have, to happen because Yeshua said He's going to rise, and they're going to make sure He does. But the problem here is they don't seem to be thinking too clearly because for the disciples to make that claim, people are going to start asking for, well, if He rose from the dead, where is He? You know, you can't just have an empty tomb. You, you need, if there's a resurrection that took place, you need someone to be, have been resurrected. And... So that plot wouldn't have really worked too good. 
Once they had made the tomb secure and sealed the stone with a Roman seal, breaking that seal for any reason was punishable by death. Now remember, there's a Roman guard now standing outside the tomb. It's been sealed. There's a guard there. The Roman soldiers would have defended that seal with their lives because their lives would have been taken if that seal was broken on their watch. All right, so this is kind of a big deal. The tomb is sealed. There's a guard there making sure the disciples don't come. No one tries to come <laughs> to take it away. All right, with that in mind, let's look at our text in John. In these 10 verses in John 20, 1 through 10, the word tomb is repeated seven times. All right, again, the seven, the number of perfection, totality. Yeshua is in the tomb. Now, on the first day of the week, Young's literal translation reads like this, and on the first of the Sabbaths, very interesting read, but this is a Hebrew idiom that seems to have signified a whole week. The interval between the Sabbaths was that week, and this could be translated on day one of the week. See, the Jews numbered their days. They didn't name them as we do. It's these Sunday, Monday, that's actually after a pagan reference to other gods and some people still freak out about this, and I've read arguments. We shouldn't use those. Get over it. It's just a day. We, that's what we call them. You know, you could call it day one, day two, whatever. You know, we know what it's meaning, all right? Well, the Sabbath was the seventh day because it commemorated the seventh day when God rested from His work on creation. And they always worshipped the Jews on the Sabbath day. Well, Yeshua's resurrection takes place on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, which is first fruits. But Sunday was also the first day of creation. Right? Sabbath was the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day. So what happened on the first day? It's when He started the creation, right? So the resurrection is picturing a new creation in Christ. He's coming out of the grave. Life is coming out of death. This is the new creation. After Pentecost, it became custom for the New Covenant Church to worship on the first day of the week. And Yeshua's appearances on three successive Sunday nights kind of set the stage for believers worshiping on Sunday. He rose on Sunday. He appeared to them three separate times on Sunday. That's kind of they started doing their worship on Sunday. Now, it says Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. John doesn't mention that Mary was accompanied here by any other women. If you just had this gospel, you read it, it sounds like Mary's there by herself, right? Well, this has troubled a lot of writers, and there's a lot of ink been spilled on this, arguing about these gospels have discrepancies in them. And listen, people, the gospel writers are each telling the story from their perspective. God chose different people to tell the story from their perspective. And John's focusing on Mary. Anybody know why he just focuses on Mary Magdalene? She's his sister. This is Lazarus' sister, Mary. And so it kind of makes sense that he just, I'm going to talk about my sister. Forget about those other ladies that were there. But a lot of people get troubled with this. Well, Matthew says that uh, Mary Magdalene was there, but he also says the other Mary in 26, or 2761. Mark refers to Mary, the mother of Joses in 1547, and Mary, the mother of James and Salome in 16.1. Luke includes Joanna and other women in 2410. There's all kinds of women there. Well, this is not a discrepancy. John simply chooses to focus on Mary. That's all it is. In all the synoptic accounts, Mary Magdalene is always mentioned first. She's the first one to come to the tomb. Like I said, I believe that she was his sister, and that's why he focuses on her. Uh, she's one of the four prominent Marys in the New Testament. She was freed from seven demons by Yeshua, according to Luke 8.2. What's really significant about this text is not that you know, John only mentions one Mary. The significant thing is that he mentions a woman as the first witness to the resurrection. Why is that so significant? Well, in that world, women are second-class citizens. All right, Christ chose to appear, first of all, to a woman, not a man, the first to testify to the risen Lord was a woman who Yeshua had cast out seven demons. 
You know, if the resurrection was a hoax, they should have picked a better witness to start out with, right? I mean, we're going to come up with this great scheme, but then we're going to have a, wit a woman be the first eyewitness. And a woman of maybe some sketchy moral character here. No, I think if it was a hoax, they'd have chose a respected male of the community. A woman's evidence, according to Mishnah, was not normally admissible in court. According to Mishnah, Rosh Hashanah 1.8. All right, so it doesn't do any good to get a woman's testimony in court. It was no good. All right, they didn't believe her. He says that Mary got there while it was dark. This is another statement that appears to conflict, what Mark writes, which states that when the woman came to the tomb, the sun had already risen. And again, people are going off on this, you know. Critics of the Bible love little things like this that they can try to attack the Bible for. And all they're showing is really their own ignorance, okay? Because the Bible's in perfect harmony. you just got to understand what's going on here. What is likely happening here is that the women came in groups or individually, not as a whole group together, and they arrived at different times. All right, the sun's coming up. She gets there, it's dark, and these other women show up, and the sun's coming up. That could be a possibility. Another explanation, because you know how John likes symbolism, and he likes double meanings. as We see that all through the Gospel. One of the themes that John has been putting through this whole time is light and darkness, Right? Constant themes throughout the gospel. Darkness pictures sin, pictures ignorance. Nicodemus came by night. Judas left while it was dark, and so on. And Yeshua has declared himself that he is the light. So this day, this first day, started out in darkness. Yeshua is dead. But it's moving towards the light because the tomb was empty. That's how it was for those who went to the empty tomb. At first, the darkness of ignorance and unbelief. But as the light began to rise over the eastern sky, the darkness began to be dispelled with the knowledge that, hey, this tomb is empty. You know, John loves to stress the symbolic aspect of things. And here he's saying, hey, it's still dark when she got there. But guess what? The light's coming. It says she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, that's kind of all he really tells us about. He doesn't give us a lot of the details here. Matthew 28 and Mark 16 kind of fill in a lot of these additional details about this stone. So let's go back and look at their accounts. Uh, Matthew 28, 1 through 4. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, so there you got Mary and the other Mary, they went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Wow, John doesn't tell us anything about that. And an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. John doesn't tell us anything about that either. All right. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. All right. So that's Matthew's account. Let's go look at Mark's account. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome. So there you go again. He's adding these other women brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, so, you know, Mark's saying sun's up, John's saying still dark, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? They're like, how are we going to get in this thing? You know, who's going to roll this away? We know we're not capable of doing that. And so they're questioning this. And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. All right. Mark doesn't identify this young man as an angel, but Matthew does. You know, for some reason, we have this need to always put halos and wings on angels. But most of the time in the Bible, they just appear as men. Did you get that? They appear as not women. I'm sorry, women, but when you, you know, people say, oh, she's an angel. Not biblically, she's not. Angels are always men. Okay, give us a little credit. We're just angelic in our being, all right? <laughs> I don't know why we always make them women, but, you know, they're, they're men. In the Bible, they always appear as men. 
And that's the case here. Now, the word here for alarmed uh, in the Greek is ekthombao, and it means to throw into terror or amazement. So they're caught up in trembling. I mean, they're in awe of what they heard from the angel in the tomb. It's just like they can't wrap their head around what's going on here. All right, let's go back to John chapter 20. They saw the stone had been taken away. All right, so, you know, what do you think about when you think about this stone? Well, you want to get some insight? Let's go into some cultural understanding here. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible, which I recommend many times. It's just very good at bringing out the culture, the backgrounds that are going on. It says this. In this area, a tomb entrance was often covered by a disc-shaped rock, a yard or meter in diameter, requiring multiple people to move it. Such a stone lay in grooves, but could not be moved from inside. See, the inside, you just you, there's nothing to grab, there's nothing to slide. It's in this groove, cut in the rock, and it has to be rolled from the outside. <clears throat> The practice is common enough for John to take for granted here that his audience understands it. So he says it doesn't go into detail here because everybody understood this practice. They saw it all the time. Now, the text doesn't tell us whether she looked inside the tomb. It just says she saw the stone roll away and she takes off running. Well, the other Gospels say she went in the tomb. She saw the angel, so there's more there. Verse 2 says, so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Yeshua loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they laid him. So it seems that Mary saw the tomb was open and just took off running. That's what it sounds like. But again, Mark tells us there was an angel there. They went inside. So Mary runs to Peter's house. All right. Peter was kind of the head of this bunch, you know, so she goes there. And then her and Peter run together to Lazarus' house. Now the text says, the other disciple, the one whom Yeshua loved. Now here the expression, the other disciple, is joined for the first time with the one who Yeshua loved, which helps us identify the other disciple who we saw earlier in our study had access to the house of the high priest Annas. We know that the one who Yeshua loved is Lazarus. We've been talking about that since the beginning. And so the other disciple here is the same disciple, this is Lazarus. Let's back up a minute to the trial of Yeshua. Simon Peter followed Yeshua, and so did another disciple. Okay, The disciple was known to the high priest. This other disciple the high priest knew. He entered with Yeshua into the court of the high priest. You couldn't do this if you were not a priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who we know, who was known to the high priest, again, he stood this is said twice here, he's stressing this, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watching at the door and brought Peter in. You know, so Lazarus goes out, hey, I know this guy, he's okay, let me bring him in. Now, the text tells us the other disciple was known to the high priest. He's the one that got Peter in. Now, if you compare John 18, this other disciple was known to the high priest, to Acts 4, I think you'll see that the other disciple could not be the apostle John. Acts 4, 1 through 23 tells us what happened to Peter and John following the healing of the crippled man. Peter and John were seized. They're brought before the religious leaders there in order to be questioned about the miracle. And verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Yeshua. Notice here that these Jewish leaders recognized it was at the moment they suddenly understood that these men had been with Yeshua. Now the principal thing we need to get out of this passage is that it was at this point that the high priest and the other rulers became acquainted with Peter and John for the first time. Oh, these are disciples of his. But the text in John 18 tells us the other disciple was known to the high priest. This teaches us the high priest didn't know John or Peter before this incident. So the other disciple could not have been John. We'll talk about this a little more in a little minute when we get to, get to verse 8 here. It says, Mary says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've taken Him. It seems that Mary meant that some of Yeshua's enemies had stolen Him. 
Maybe she thought the angels took them. Because she just says they. She doesn't really, who she means here, we don't really know. But somebody took them. He's gone. Maybe she meant grave robbers. See, that's a possibility. Robbing of graves was a really common crime. One of the reasons they robbed the graves was to get these linen garments off the dead bodies. They were valuable. I mean, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? It was so common in that day that the Emperor Claudius eventually ordered capital punishment to be met out to those convicted of destroying tombs, removing bodies, or displacing the ceiling stones. So anybody caught robbing a grave was going to be put to death under Claudius. Now, Mary uses the plural here, we. And I think this is significant because those critics who say, oh, that she came by herself, that doesn't fit with the other Gospels. Well, if she came by herself, then why is she saying we here? We indicates there's others present and confirms the synoptic accounts that there were other women there, all right? John's just focusing on her. He says, we don't know where they laid them. Were they grave robbers? Were they, you know, who took them? She doesn't know but she just feels somebody stole the body. It hasn't occurred to her that he's resurrected. Again, they've been with the Lord. The women have been following him too. He's been teaching them. They don't get it. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. All right, They were going toward the tomb. So Mary tells them, and the first thing they do is they take off. They, I don't think they believe Mary. The NIV Cultural Background Study Bible again says this. Aside from it being dark when Mary indeed headed for the tomb, in other words, it was so dark she didn't even know what she saw, men in the ancient Mediterranean world often viewed women as undependable in their testimony. I don't know if their eyes weren't as good as men or what was the problem, but they just, you know, they didn't trust them. Even if they trusted her fully, however, they would want to discover where the body was. In other words, if the tomb is empty, where is the body? We've got to figure this out. All right? And it says, the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Wow, the theology that's brought out of this is sometimes so ridiculous. So many writers make a big deal out of this. They say this proves that John was younger than Peter and therefore he outran him. This proves that it was John. The other disciple is John. That's what, basically what the argument is. This verse doesn't say anything about John anywhere. It doesn't say anything about his age. I think John the Apostle was younger than Peter, without a doubt. I think he was the youngest of the apostles. But he's not the other disciple mentioned here. And people, let me give you a... Did we lose all sound? Hello? I know, anybody back there? What, we all right? We're good? Okay. They say this proves that John was younger than Peter. Well, again, I don't think age is always correlated with running speed, okay? I got a 16-year-old grandson that I can outrun, all right? So it's not always just because, and I'm a little bit older than him, all right? <laughs> it's not just about age. So that's kind of a dung, 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 dung argument, yeah. It's dumb too, all right? The detail of the other disciple outrunning Peter is probably just to confirm an eyewitness report. In other words, he's saying, I was there and you know, I outran him. First-hand witness, that's what he wants us to get out of this. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he didn't go in. So Lazarus gets to the tomb first, but he doesn't go in, he just kind of stops there and looks in. This uh, stop to look in here is from the Greek verb, Perakupto, which means to bend over in order to see something better. And this is what would have had to have been necessary because these tombs had a very low opening. They're only like three feet high. So he'd have to bend over to try to look into that tomb to see what was going on there. Now, this also tells us there must have been enough daylight to see the interior of the tomb. And if that's true, it suggested that the tomb faced east. Sun's coming up in the east. And it's interesting that the instructions for God's tabernacle, it was always to be facing east. And the temple in Jerusalem also was built facing east. So it's fate, the tomb's facing east, 
The sun's going in the tomb, revealing that there's nobody in there. Now, it says, he saw the linen cloths. Now, in this text, in these verses, he uses three different words for saw. They're all translated saw in our text. Three different Greek words. All right, because they're telling us something different about each one of these. All right. Uh, this first word here, Lazarus, it says he saw, this is the Greek word blepo. Blepo is used uh, essentially to glance or take a quick look. He, in other words, he just looked in the tomb, boom, he sees it's empty. The second use of saw is in verse 6, where Peter saw the strips of linen laying there. This verb, translated saw, is a different Greek word. This is the Greek word theoreo. And this is a word from which we get our English word theorize or theory. And it suggests more than a simple glance, but a kind of pondering. You know, a thinking over what, was, what they're looking at. And the third one is in verse 8, where it says he saw and believed. The Greek word here is horao. This is the third verb, all translated saw, but this one means to see with comprehension. By Hebraism, it means to experience. And that's probably the force of it here. He saw, and it's like, this just he's, his eyes are open here to what's going on. So three different words, saw, all translated saw in our English, in the ESV here, three different Greek words. That's why it does, a, you know, he's trying to tell us different things with each word. There's a progression here. You know, there's a glance, then there's a contemplate, and then it's like, he believes. But you miss that in the English. All right, let's go to verse 6 and 7. Then Simon Peter came, following him, went into the tomb, saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Yeshua's head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. So Lazarus stops at the entrance of the tomb. Peter gets there and goes right in. All right? That's Peter. He's impetuous. He doesn't, you know, it's a grave. You know, you're not supposed to go in there with graves. He doesn't worry about it. He just runs right in. The body of Yeshua is definitely gone. But the scene inside the tomb was not what one have expected if it had been robbed by grave robbers. Okay? They forgot one of the most, the body's not any good to them. They forgot the most important thing, the cloths. Okay? They left all that stuff in there. Lazarus again mentioned linen cloths in the plural. He says the cloths. And the reference is probably to the Sidon or the burial shroud. They would, uh, from, from what I can get from the historical writers, they, they would anoint these with spices. You know, remember we saw they took 75 pounds of spices. And they take these linen cloths and they soak these in the spices. They pack the spices and they wrap them around, kind of mummy on it. You know, like, look, looks like a mummy, basically. And they got these all packed with 75, so it's heavier now, 75 pounds of spices. Then the Jews would take a shroud, a long piece, so it's like four foot wide, and they'd wrap it from the feet up over the head and back down. You've all heard of the Shroud of Turin. That was typical for Jewish burial. Okay, that would be put over them. All right? <clears throat> the, the cloth that covered his head uh, when he was taken down from the cross and used for his burial. Now, Lazarus mentions this cloth as part of his own burial, in John 11, and we'll look at that in a little minute here, but the idea of uh, the burial cloth here is sundarion. It's a cloth that covered his head. Alright? It was the practice for a cloth to be rolled up, put under the chin, over the top of the head, and then tied. What was the purpose of that? Keep the mouth shut. Okay? That was the head cloth. So they put that over him so they would keep the mouth shut. Um, and I don't know exactly what the reason is for that, but I know with idols, they would open the idol's mouth so the spirit could get in there, their God could get in and take over the idol. So maybe they're keeping something in there or keeping something out of there, I don't know. But they, they kept the, you know, the cloth was tied to keep his chin up there. And uh, <clears throat> the observation that the cloth was still rolled up you know, could indicate that this oval loop that with the ends tied together was just laying there like it had been around his head. You know, still tied together, it's just laying there like all of a sudden the body just left it. Okay? It says, the text here says, folded up in a place by itself. The Greek here means 
it still retained its twisted shape or its annular shape. So it's not the idea that somebody got this cloth and folded it up nice and set it aside. It's like, man, it was just like it was on his head. Like his head was still there, but his head's gone, and just the cloth is still laying there. All right? And there's a lot of speculation about the grave cloths and what they tell us. You know, and some people say that, you know, that's trying to tell us that, you know, the wrapping strips were all almost had a form of a body like, because they were so loaded with spices, if the body disappeared, they would have kind of kept that form. And so some argue that that's what it's trying to tell us, that the body just disappeared out of there. I don't know. I think the idea of the grave clothes, what they're trying to tell us is this wasn't done by thieves because they would have taken those cloths. Anyone who had come to remove the body, whether the authorities or anyone else, would not have, first of all, taken the time to unwrap them in the tomb. All right, if you're robbing a tomb under penalty of death, you got Roman guards out there, you know, you go in there and say, let's just unwrap all this stuff because we want just the body with nothing on it. No, that'd be ridiculous. You grab that thing and get out of there. It just doesn't make sense. If grave robbers had removed the body, they would have taken the expensive cloth which Joseph and Nicodemus put on there when he prepared them for burial. All right, so then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. So John Lazarus, he's standing outside. Peter runs in, so he goes in. And he goes inside, and he saw the grave clothes in the condition described in the previous verse. And it says, he saw and believed. Now, the disciple who Yeshua loved had come to believe that Yeshua really had somehow risen from the dead. He saw and believed. Listen, this, what's incredible here, he's reached resurrection faith without seeing the risen Christ. See, the others saw him, okay, and then they're like, oh, wow, he's here, obviously he rose. He believes before he even sees the risen, risen Christ, all right? He believes it. Now, okay, this is the other disciple. So early on, the first day of the week, the other disciple saw and believed, okay? That's, we're still in the first, first day, first day of the week. We're on Sunday, early in the morning. But I want you to notice what happens later that day. Luke tells us this. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. Now, the they here is referring to the two disciples who met Yeshua on the road to Emmaus. He's talking with the disciples. They join the gathering. They go back to tell the others what they saw. They saw Christ. So they join the gathering of the eleven, and then Yeshua shows up. Now, notice what the text tells us about them in verse 41. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Okay, this is the 11. They still disbelieved. This is in the evening. So John still disbelieved. John's one of the 11. But the other disciple, he believed that morning. The other disciple was clearly not one of the 12 because the twelve here are still not believing in the evening. But the other disciple already had believed. Why does the sight of the linen wrappings cause Lazarus to believe? Why did that sight affect him maybe more than Peter? Okay, exactly. Listen, he had worn those grave clothes. He had had them on. And he goes in that tomb and he sees those clothes laying there. He would never forget the time when he wore the linen grave clothes. The face cloth here, mentioned in verse 7, is the Greek sundarion. This is the same word used uh, of Lazarus. The man who had died came out. All right, He's alive now. He's standing there, but his hands and his feet are bound with linen strips, and his face is wrapped with a sundarion. And Yeshua said to them, unbind him and let him go. So Lazarus is familiar with this face cloth. He's standing there alive, but this thing's keeping his mouth shut. And he's just, you know, that would have been a kind of a freaky thing. You're all wrapped up, you know, like a mummy. Your mouth's, thick, you know, and the Lord says, hey, let that guy go. Take that stuff off him. So he had been there. And so he wore these things. So the sight of that had to really hit him hard. You know, I know this. I know, I've been there, and guess what? I'm alive, 
He's gone. He's alive. Okay. Um, well, I guess we go on without PowerPoint. It's, it's, we're, we're good from here on out anyway. We don't, it's not that significant. <clears throat> For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. This is just another editorial comment by the author. Neither Peter nor the beloved disciple had understood the Scriptures concerning the resurrection. You know, it's possible for Lazarus to be referring to a lot of different Scriptures here. Uh, Psalm 16.10, Hosea 6.2, Jonah 2.1. But it's also possible he's not referring to any specific Scripture. He's just talking about the Tanakh in general. The Tanakh taught this. The feast taught this. But they didn't put it together as of yet. Then the disciples went back to their homes. This verse is just a transitional verse. Peter and Lazarus head home. Lazarus, no doubt, very excited because he believes now. Yeshua had risen. Well, Luke tells us that Peter went home marveling at what had happened. So Peter's like, ah, oh, this is exciting. He's not sure all putting it together yet, but he's, he's pretty excited about it. All four Gospels include the resurrection. It was a historical event that serves as the height of each Gospel. Just as Yeshua was really dead, now he's really alive again. The resurrection is the heart of Christianity. And that's why the resurrection is always under attack. Because without it, you don't have Christianity. Some theorize that a literal, physical resurrection did not take place. Over the centuries, great men of understanding have sought to come up with other kind of explanations for the empty tomb. In other words, there's, there's got to be some reason for this other than resurrection. So I want to look at just a couple of them, um, explanations, empty explanations about an empty tomb. One of them, um, the first one we'll look at is, Yeshua didn't die on the cross, but merely swooned. This alternative explanation has been repackaged in many variations. The most popular variant was called the Passover Plot. It was published in 1965. The basic argument is that Yeshua and His disciples conspired to fulfill messianic prophecy by faking Yeshua's death and resurrection. They managed to manipulate the Jewish leaders into trying Him, the people into demanding the crucifixion, and the Roman government into executing Him. Now, the legal manipulation would have been a miracle in itself. You know, get all these people to do what you want. Before being nailed to the cross, they say Yeshua was given a drug it appeared to make him look dead, and so he tricked the soldiers into removing him from the cross while he's still alive. Just think about what we've already seen here, people. They, they say once they put him in the tomb, the cool, damp air in the tomb revived him, and he appeared alive before his followers. So that cool, damp air, you know, he's like, wow, I'm refreshed now. Push this big stone out of the way. Let's just use a little logic, okay? Uh, Yeshua was beaten so badly that he couldn't even carry his own cross member to the cross. All right, They had to grab a bystander to help him out. He had nails driven through his wrists and his feet. The blood loss you know, would have been pretty great. The blood poured out of his feet, his hands, and his back from the beating. And finally, the spear is jammed in his heart. If someone can get past the impossible odds of survival... There's a few problems still. How does a man who has had spikes driven through his feet and limbs get up and walk? Somehow Yeshua revived, untangled himself, got the grave clothes off, pushed a massive stone out of the entrance to the tomb without any guards seeing it. There's guards out there. They didn't hear it. They didn't see it. And he ran away unnoticed. Not only did he escape, he walked seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus to meet two travelers with Nails driven through his feet. How is it that most people can't walk with minor foot pain and yet Yeshua walks all these miles with holes in his feet? And also he had full use of his hands because he took over the evening meal and he broke bread with the disciples, all right? You know, we can come up with dozens of functions that would cause him excruciating pain if this was a faked resurrection, not to mention how weakly and bad he must have looked from all he's gone through. It seems a little hard to get the multitude fired up about seeing a half-dead Yeshua. Ah, oh, we tricked him. We got them all, you know. Let's, let, I got an idea. 
They pull off this fake thing, they get it, and then they decide, it's a fake. Let's all go out and die for this. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Let's go be tortured. Let's go be put to death for this fake thing we're pulling off, all right? All right, one of the other things is Yeshua's body was stolen. Now, this is, you know, the only counter-argument that really is remotely logical, but also has its flaws that can't be explained. First of all, who stole the body? It's undeniable that the body of Yeshua was no longer in the graves. All right? The disciples, the Jews, the Roman soldiers, all concurred that the body was missing. As one historian put it, history's silence is deafening concerning the body of Yeshua. No one has ever claimed to see the body of Yeshua after the resurrection. In other words, they never found the body. And if you're dead, your body's got to be somewhere. If the Jews or Romans stole it, they would have, you know, when Christianity gets going, everybody's talking about, we're serving a risen Savior. They said, uh, we got a body over here. That's, y'all just shut up because it's just a, it's a fake. Here's the body that would shut Christianity up. That would have been the end of it. We know the soldiers didn't have it. They would have produced it. They were paid for their silence. How much more would they have been paid to produce the body? There would have been no need to think up and rehearse the story of disciples stealing the soldiers. <laughs> they didn't want anything to do with it. Okay? When, when Yeshua was arrested, they all ran away. All right? They never even showed up to help bury him. They just, you know, they were all pretty scared. You know, Peter was probably the boldest of the twelve. He denied Yeshua three times. And to show how cowardly he was at this point, he was afraid of a servant girl who had no say in that culture at all. Yet when she confronted Peter, he called down curses on himself to prove he didn't follow Yeshua. They were too afraid to come forward to take help in the burial. How is it they suddenly bold enough to risk death, to sneak among the guards, move the stone without arousing anyone, steal the body, and then go out and die? For what was all a fake. And consider these cloths, the, bur- the burial clothes there. Anybody went in the tomb would have, you know, like I said, they're taking the body and run. They're not going to unwrap it. This is, this is just dumb, all right? This argument doesn't hold any water. The disciples were way too afraid. Uh, the Jews wouldn't do it. They want to they, they show the body if they had it. They're not going to hide it. The Romans, the same thing. All right, well, there's a third possibility. He, he was resurrected. How about that one? We see the evidence against the resurrection falls short. But what evidence leads credibility to the resurrection? Well, let's begin by examining the disciples. These men all fled in all directions when Yeshua was arrested. They offer no defense on His behalf. Yet after the resurrection, we see this huge change in their lives. These men who were afraid to be present at Yeshua's crucifixion and burial we're now going into the very city where the crucifixion occurred and confronting the very people who crucified Him. The crowds were still present, and so many of the council members that tried Yeshua and the soldiers who crucified Him, they're still there. Why would they suddenly have such a change of heart that they'd preach the same Yeshua they had denied? Not only did they preach the resurrection, they also condemned those who were responsible for His death and called them into account. Look at Acts 2.22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Yeshua of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst. You yourselves know. You know, this Yeshua who was healing people, who was raising the dead, who was healing... You guys know about this. This Yeshua delivered up according to the divine plan and foreknowledge of God. In other words, it's all part of the plan of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised Him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for Him to be held by it. You know, to create a legend, you wouldn't go to where eyewitnesses were and exaggerate the story. Okay, legends are born by carrying the story to distant lands or waiting till the facts or the people who knew the facts died off. The disciples went while the iron was still hot. They go into Jerusalem, the city had happened. They're confronting people who did it, and they're saying he's risen from the dead. 
You know, and there was a lot of eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. For example, look at Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 15. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. That's a big crowd of witnesses. Most of whom, he says, are still alive. In other words, go check it out. Go talk to these people. They're still alive. You can go talk to them. They'll tell you they've seen the resurrected Christ. To deny the resurrection of Yeshua is to destroy the entire basis of the Christian faith. And that's why it's under attack. The Christian faith is not based primarily on the teachings of Christ, the life of Christ, the miracles of Christ, the death of Christ. The Christian faith is based on all of these culminating in the resurrection of Yeshua from the dead. If there's no resurrection, all these other factors are useless. If there's no resurrection, people, our faith is vain. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is in vain. And that's because the entire Christian faith rests on one historical, verifiable point, the bodily resurrection of Yeshua from the dead. The tomb was empty because He had risen, and there's really no other explanation for it that makes any sense whatsoever. Now, if you can't believe in the resurrection, you've got to make up excuses because you got, I mean, the body was gone. And if they could have found it, believe me, they would have, because I believe those Romans searched high and low. Uh, we mentioned it before, but if you want to see a good movie that really will make you think about this, the movie Risen is from the Roman soldier's perspective on how he's hunting for this body afterwards because he's like, it's got to be somewhere. And he can't find it, and he comes to faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that every time we go to it, we'd be taught of it. We would be open, Lord, to learn the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, for the truth of the resurrection. We know that Christianity is based on this, Lord. We know because He raised, we have eternal life. Father, thank You for Your grace to us. Thank You for the life that You've given, the life You've provided through the death of Your Son and the resurrection of Your Son. Lord, may we walk in the truth of who we are in You. Thank You, Lord. Amen.